was Prince Charming. She was like a teenage girl in love with an older boy. But when her soulmate turned abusive, the nurse became the prisoner, trapped in a bizarre relationship she couldn't break out of. He would call me 24 hours a day. I had to sleep with the phone in my ear. You could see him ratcheting up the pressure on her. And the pressure would eventually push a desperate woman to do the unthinkable. I had the gun in my hand, and the gun went off. And I shot him. Point blank. On the morning of August 9, 2005, Jennifer Hyatt walked out of the Roan County Courthouse in Kingston, Tennessee, and got behind the wheel of her Ford Explorer. Her husband, incarcerated felon George Hyatt, had just pled guilty to an outstanding burglary charge, adding years to his already lengthy sentence. He's just not going to get out anytime soon. He had no future ahead of him. Jennifer and George had been married for less than three months. They'd never spent a moment alone as man and wife. Now it looked like they might never be together. But would that necessarily be a bad thing? I think Jennifer was scared and in love all at the same time. George tormented Jennifer, allegedly harassing her day and night over the phone and tracking her every move. I had people watching me. He knew everything I did. She did try to commit suicide because of the way he was treating her. Now on the morning of August 9th, Jennifer was prepared to do something even more drastic. She was just vulnerable enough to believe that it was the only thing that she could do to save her own life. At approximately 10 a.m., two prison guards were loading George into a prison van when Jennifer leveled a handgun at the three men. They was trying to push George on into the, into the van, and he hollered, shoot him. But would she do her sadistic lover's bidding or end his abuse forever? George wasn't always Jennifer's torturer. In fact, at the beginning of their relationship, he was her protector. They met in 2004 at Tennessee's Northwest Community Correction Complex, where Jennifer worked as a nurse. It was her first job out of nursing school. She decided to uh, go into this nursing because she just enjoyed it, and I was very proud of her turning her life around. Jennifer had arrived in Tennessee three years earlier. Originally from outside Salt Lake City, she'd fled Utah in an effort to escape from her first husband. He got into the drugs. He went to crank and then to meth. And he got really bad on the meth. And when her husband went to jail on drug charges in 1999, Jennifer filed for divorce and started over. She wanted to just get the kids away from that whole scene. And so when she took the kids, she just went to Tennessee. Settling in near friends in West Tennessee, the mother of three remarried and enrolled in a nursing program. As part of the program, Jennifer did a clinical rotation at a nearby prison. And she did more than just work in the hospital ward. The prison put Jennifer to work with its close security inmates. They couldn't come out, like to Medline, they couldn't come out to get bandage changes and stuff. I had to go to the units and do this. So I was one-on-one -on -one all the time with them. A guard always accompanied her. But for many of the inmates, it was as close to being alone with a woman as they could get. She was getting harassed by a lot of the male prisoners. There was a few that would always show themselves to me. With the guard present, Jennifer wasn't in any real danger. But she soon became fed up with the constant flashing and lewd talk. After a while, you're just like, okay, you know, enough. You're men. Grow up. One day, Jennifer recounts, a guard offered her a possible solution. He's like, well, you know, I know somebody here that could walk you around the different units and kind of protect you. Jennifer expected a senior guard, someone who could command the inmates' respect. Instead, she says she got her first lesson in how life really works on the inside. Inmates ran that place. 
it wasn't the officers. It wasn't. And I hate to say that, but it wasn't. In fact, according to Jennifer, it wasn't just the inmates that ran the prison. It was one inmate in particular. George Hyatt had manipulated the system. He had tried to get everything to work for him. He's supposed to be a really smooth and slick talker. A career criminal with convictions for burglary, armed robbery, and assault, George had been in and out of prison since he was a teen. And he wasn't always out on parole. He had been charged several times with escape. Serving a 35-year sentence for assaulting a guard, George's exploits had earned him respect and fear from his fellow inmates. He became affiliated with a gang in prison, and he had that attitude of wanting to be intimidating, wanting to be that bully. The other inmates were afraid of him. They wouldn't want to do anything to piss him off. The sexual harassment stopped. And soon, Jennifer started to suspect that her protector was more than just another inmate. He would hand me $100, say, here, go do your hair, go do your makeup, go do your nails, go do something, go have fun. Jennifer liked the cash, but she loved the way George made her feel. He always made me feel special, like I was number one. And it wasn't long before Jennifer found herself falling for George. She was madly in love with George. They were going to be so happy. He had me convinced that he was wrongly prosecuted. It was only a matter of time before he was free. Even within the prison, however, there were limits to George's influence. In August of 2004, Jennifer lost her job after guards caught her smuggling contraband into George. I got fired for bringing shrimp to him one day. She was caught bringing in food into the prison for George. Well, that's a, that's a no-no. And the shrimp had just been a tiny portion of what Jennifer fetched for George. I brought him in $500 one time. I took him a cell phone one time. George kept the phone hidden in his cell. Over the next 12 months, it would become the shackle that kept Jennifer chained to her convict boyfriend. Out of a job in the summer of 2004, Jennifer didn't think she'd hear from George again. I'm like, you know, he was probably just using me. But George kept calling her. He sent her gifts and letters professing that he still loved her. He even asked Jennifer to marry him. I believed him. I couldn't do anything for him, so what would be the motivation for him to lie to me? Did George truly love Jennifer? Or was he plotting something far bigger than smuggling cell phones and shrimp? One thing was certain, he pulled out the stops when it came to convincing Jennifer he was sincere. In fact, George even showered Jennifer's family with gifts. He would send me and my mother flowers, goodie baskets, and stuff like that. But would a few bouquets and goodie baskets be enough to get Jennifer's family to overlook the fact that George was in prison? He was very, very sweet. He was very nice. And Jennifer? She filed for a divorce from her second husband in November of 2004 and devoted herself entirely to George. He would call me 24 hours a day. I had to sleep with the phone in my ear. If I didn't, I was cussed and screamed and hollered at and called every name in the book. She would fall asleep. He would scream and holler and threaten suicide and threaten to leave her if she didn't wake up and talk to him. George also monitored every call Jennifer made. I had to keep it on with an earpiece in my pocket so that he could hear every conversation I had. And to keep the true nature of their abusive relationship secret, he took particular care to monitor what Jennifer said to her family. She could not call a family member without him being on the phone to see what was being said. So why didn't she just hang up? She had been taken advantage of by men most of her life. And I think George Hyatt saw her coming from a mile away. She's easily manipulated. I think Jennifer was scared and in love all at the same time. On May 21st, 2005, Jennifer and George wed in the visitor center at the Riverbend Maximum Security Institution. It took about 15, 20 minutes and I had to leave. And the next time the newlyweds met face to face, gunfire would soon follow.
In June of 2005, Jennifer sent her kids home to Utah and took a new job as a live-in nurse for a woman named Betty Dime. She was my husband's nurse, and she was real good to him, very attentive. And how did Jennifer explain her absent boyfriend who was always on the phone? It was easy. I thought he was a soldier in Iraq. For Jennifer, however, her one-time protector had become a torturer. She started taking medication for anxiety and depression and thought increasingly of suicide. She just thought she would be better off not around. And on the night of June 24, 2005, Jennifer decided to act. She unscrewed the cap on her medication and poured pills out by the handful. I just decided to take them. Took it all. Like 15,000 milligrams of Elevil. And George called me, like, as I was taking the last of them. He heard, I guess, the pill bottle or whatever. Over the phone, Jennifer told George that she had taken the pills. He freaked out, go to the hospital, go to the hospital, go to the hospital. And I finally got tired of hearing it, so I got in the truck and I left. While Jennifer drove, George called the hospital. Emergency room staff found Jennifer in the parking lot, passed out in her truck. She was in a, in a coma for a couple of days on a respirator. They had told Miss Betty to call my family because I wouldn't make it another 24 hours. Jennifer survived. But what would she do when she woke up? Would she finally call the police and inform them of George's abuse? Or would she decide on something more drastic than suicide to escape the nightmare she was living? On the morning of August 9th, 2005, two weeks after the suicide attempt, two prison guards led a shackled George Hyatt across the courthouse parking lot in Kingston, Tennessee. He was getting ready to face new charges in Roan County. For George, each court appearance was a brief taste of freedom. In some courthouses, the jail is attached to the courthouse. That is not the case in Kingston. So if they're walking somebody in, um, you know, that's an inmate, they have to walk them right through that parking lot. But that morning, as the guards walked George to the corrections van that was supposed to take him back to prison, a Ford Explorer pulled into the parking lot. It was Jennifer. I pulled up behind the van, and uh, I got out of the truck. I had the gun in my hand. Coming up, Jennifer's desperate act leaves one man dead. But which man? She fired one fatal shot. On the morning of August 9th, 2005, prison guards Wayne Cotton Morgan and Larry Porky Harris were loading incarcerated felon George Hyatt into a Tennessee corrections van when a Ford Explorer squealed to a stop behind them. George's wife, Jennifer Hyatt, stepped out of the truck and leveled a 9mm handgun at the three men. George's psychological abuse had driven her to attempt suicide just weeks before. And now it was about to drive Jennifer to something worse. I said, hey, guys. One of them turned around and looked at me, and he said, go away. And that's when George yelled, shoot him. She fired one fatal shot. She didn't, however, shoot her abusive husband. She did exactly as he told her. The failure of her suicide attempt, according to Jennifer, had finally broken what little will she'd had to resist. After that week in the hospital, I realized I couldn't fight anymore. He used and abused her. Jennifer Hyatt was brainwashed in the classic, classic sense. Bullied into obeying his every command, Jennifer had spent the two weeks since the suicide attempt on the phone with George, planning the escape attempt. I was supposed to hold the gun on him. He was going to grab their guns, and we were supposed to put them in the van and then just drive away. But that morning, the plan changed. And that's when George yelled, shoot him. Cotton Morgan turned around, and he grabbed the gun. And it scared me. Struck in the abdomen by Jennifer's first shot, Officer Morgan fell to the ground. Then, as bystanders dove for cover, Jennifer unloaded her weapon at Officer Porky Harris. Porky starts shooting back. There was a gun battle right there in the parking lot. 
Jennifer ran back to the Explorer. George Hyatt bolted from the prison van and tried to escape through the intense gunfire. He's bound at the ankles, but he was able to scurry, basically, across the, the parking lot. As Jennifer pulled away, Officer Harris continued firing. Another officer emptied his weapon, his duty weapon, and then was able to get Cotton's weapon and empty it. He shot the front of the truck trying to hit the tires. He failed. The Explorer pulled out of the parking lot and disappeared into the traffic. It happened so fast, a minute, minute and a half. Police and emergency personnel were on the scene in minutes. Cotton Morgan was airlifted to the University of Tennessee Medical Center in Knoxville, but it was too late. The in-flight nurse told me at UT that for all intents and purposes, um, uh, dad was gone when they got him on the helicopter. Back in Kingston, the town was in a state of siege. Schools were locked down, streets closed, law enforcement blanketed the town. The next thing you know, there's TBI there, there's FBI, helicopters, dogs. Within probably an hour, hour and a half, there was probably 350 officers here to help search. Police soon found Jennifer's Explorer a few blocks away behind a Subway restaurant. And they discovered that Porky Harris's shots at the fleeing Explorer hadn't been entirely in vain. They found bullet holes in it. There was blood, too but there was no sign of the fugitives. However, a Kingston fireman who lived across the street did give police a solid description of the Hyatt's getaway vehicle, a gold Chevy minivan. He had remembered a van backing in there that night prior to the incident. Where the fugitives had gone, however, was anyone's guess. You are near I-40 and very close to I-75 split. So at that time, we had our hands full. Uh, trying to get a direction. As authorities launched a nationwide manhunt, the media pounced on the story. U.S. Marshals were all over on alert looking for them. Uh, there was a lot of appeal from the media. And considering a young woman had just broken her incarcerated lover out of jail amidst a blaze of gunfire, it wasn't long before the press made the obvious comparison. It was like a modern-day Bonnie and Clyde, the escape, the daring escape, the disregard for human life, the, the shooting right there in public. As news outlets ran with the breaking story, police back in Kingston tried to piece together the morning's events. According to what Officer Harris told his superiors, Jennifer had met with George briefly that morning, shortly after he'd arrived for his hearing. Cotton Morgan had gone out of his way to be uh, helpful to Jennifer and George Hyatt, allowing them some privacy to decide what to do on George Hyatt's case. Or had they been plotting his escape? One thing was certain, the ensuing shootout had been captured on the courthouse security cameras. In the video, you can see a vehicle pull up just behind the van and stay there for just a few seconds and then flee off. By the end of the day, that gun battle remained the last confirmed sighting of the fugitives. But the media attention was already generating a flood of leads. People were seeing the Hyatts everywhere. We had hundreds of tips coming in. You know, yes, I've seen this vehicle, it's here. Most of the tips turned out to be dead ends. Well, you know, how many vans like that one are they on the interstate? But would the police eventually find and stop the right one? The one that was, at that moment, racing north on I-75. Inside the van, Jennifer was putting all of her nursing skills to work on herself. Shot during the escape attempt, it was her blood that the authorities had found in the ditched Explorer. The officer shot the truck several times. One came in the back window and threw my seat and grazed me. And as the fugitives raced north, Jennifer did what she could to stop the bleeding. My whole left leg was soaked. Um, I had shirts wrapped around my leg. George, behind the wheel, apparently had no intention of stopping or seeking help for his wounded bride. He really didn't seem too concerned. He just kept driving, said we had to get out of Tennessee. 
Fleeing Tennessee, they were across Kentucky and almost in Ohio, just across the river from Cincinnati, when Jennifer told George she couldn't go on. I says, we've got to stop. I mean, I can't go anymore. They went up um, I-75, spent the night in Erlanger, Kentucky. At that point, that's where they get rid of the gun. George's shackles weren't quite so easy to get rid of, however. We stopped at a Lowe's because we needed some way to get his shackles off. There was only one problem. With Jennifer's legs soaked in blood and George's legs clapped in irons, there was no way they could go into the store. So George, thinking fast, pulled into the store's loading area. The van that we were in had a handicap sticker. And so one of the ladies came out that like worked at Lowe's and asked if we needed anything. George requested a hacksaw. Within an hour, the couple was checking into an Erlanger Econo Lodge. There, with his legs finally free, George's thoughts turned to his bride. It was, after all, their first night together as man and wife. All he was interested in was sex. I mean, I hadn't even gotten bleeding stopped, and that's what he wanted. He didn't care. Um, he just said, put a towel on it. After consummating their marriage, the fugitives settled down for the evening. He ordered pizza. I passed out. When she awoke a few hours later, she discovered that George had been busy. He had cut all my hair off and told me that I had to dye it black. George had reason. Their motel TV was buzzing with news bulletins about the modern day Bonnie and Clyde. And it was only then that Jennifer realized they were wanted for more than just a jailbreak. When I found out the officer died, I thought I was going to have a heart attack. I mean, I didn't know he had died. I had no clue. And I asked George, I said, does he have family? Did you know him? I mean, what, what have I done? And what would happen to Jennifer and her husband if the police caught up to them? The sun had barely come up the next morning when federal marshals and local police surrounded the Erlanger Econo Lodge. Overnight, witnesses had spotted the fugitive's minivan parked outside. They narrowed it down to, hey, yeah, this is a vehicle. We know it's them. But when the officers stormed the room, all they found were blood-soaked towels, a set of handcuffs and shackles, a hacksaw, and a few personal items. In a dumpster outside, police found a 9 millimeter pistol. And when investigators ran the plates on the gold van parked nearby, they discovered that it belonged to Jennifer's employer, Betty Dye. The grandchildren saw my van on TV, and then the TBI and the FBI moved in. That evening, TBI agents discovered that the Dyes had unwittingly aided in the escape plan. It was a pretty elaborate scheme. It was a lot of work that she put into putting these vehicles in place. Jennifer had convinced Mrs. Dye to loan her the gold minivan. She told me that uh, George was going to lose his daughter if she didn't go to court and testify for him because he was in Iraq. Jennifer, of course, had driven the van to Kingston, collected the Explorer, and launched her escape plan. And now she and George were on the run. But where? As the sun went down on August 10th, authorities were trying to get a fix on the fugitives. Were George and Jennifer still in Erlanger, or had they fled in another stashed getaway car? That evening, the authorities in Cincinnati received a promising lead. There was a cab driver who brought a couple matching the description to a hotel. Unfortunately, it wasn't until hours after dropping them off that the Cincinnati cab driver made the connection. He turned the news on and said, you know, that's the couple that I took to the hotel, to Columbus. The cab driver explained that he'd picked up the Hyatts at their motel in Erlanger, Kentucky, just south of Cincinnati, and driven them all the way to a second hotel in Columbus. Cincinnati is not close to Columbus. It's about two hours, two hours and 15 minutes between the two cities. The cab driver explained to police that the Hyatts told him they had been in a car wreck and that they needed to get to Columbus for an Amway conference. They said they were with Amway. 
and they were doing some things up in Columbus with a conference. Acting on the tip, the U.S. Marshals and the Columbus SWAT moved quickly into position. We had the whole place surrounded. There was nowhere they could have gone. Coming up, would the Hyatts surrender peacefully? Or would the modern day Bonnie and Clyde live up to their notorious namesakes? You have no idea what to expect on the other side of that door. On the evening of August 10th, Jennifer Hyatt awoke from a fretful sleep in room 236B of the America's Best Value Inn in Columbus, Ohio. I had fallen asleep for a little while. And when I woke up, I guess I'd been dreaming about what had happened. And the first thing out of my mouth was they're going to give me the death penalty for this. A little over 24 hours earlier, she blasted her husband George out of jail. In the process, she'd shot and killed corrections officer Wayne Cotton Morgan. I never planned on shooting anybody. It was just supposed to be a scare tactic. George, still savoring his first full day of freedom, shrugged off their predicament. He's like, it's not going to be that big of a deal. Moments later, the phone rang. I figured it was front desk saying, we're going to send up towels now. A female voice answered, and I just stated, Jennifer, she said yes. U.S. Marshal Nikki Ralston flashed a thumbs up to the U.S. Marshals poised outside the Hyatt's room. I was actually kind of shocked. If I was on the run, I was in a hotel room and the phone rang, I probably would not have answered the phone. Ralston told Jennifer that she was surrounded by law enforcement. I said, you need to get George, you need to lay the phone down, and you need to walk outside with your hands held high. A tense moment followed, the marshals and Columbus SWAT ready to open fire at the slightest sign of trouble. I could hear her set the phone down. I heard um, some faint whispering. George asked me, he goes, who is it? I said, the U.S. Marshals, they, we need to come out. Jennifer and George's blood-soaked honeymoon had started with a shootout. Would it end in another? After a day and a half on the run, Jennifer and George gave themselves up. I walked out the door and they told me to face them and walk towards them. And when I got to them, they put those zip cord cuffs on. The marshals also cuffed George and quickly whisked him off to jail. But Jennifer wouldn't follow just yet. They called EMTs in and the EMT says, we want her to go to the hospital. They wanted to make sure there was no bullets in my leg. Handcuffed in the back of a police cruiser, bloody and under arrest for murder, Jennifer's first thoughts were of George. She immediately went into, um, is George okay? What's going to happen to George? She didn't, didn't care much about herself. It was all about George. She didn't even want to go to the hospital. She only wanted to be with George. Jennifer was treated for her wounds, then transferred to the Franklin County Jail. Questioned by the authorities, Jennifer took complete responsibility for Officer Morgan's death. She says she did it because she loved him. Jennifer soon learned that Cotton Morgan might not be the only one to die because of her attempt to free George. For shooting a corrections officer in cold blood, premeditated, she was looking at the death penalty. Would prosecutors seek it? Without a doubt, if the public opinion back in Kingston was any indication. The public was outraged by this crime. This was a killing that went to the core of this small town in East Tennessee. The Hyatts weren't in East Tennessee, however. Before prosecutors could put George and Jennifer on trial, they'd have to get them back into the state. On the morning of August 12th, the fugitives appeared separately in an Ohio courtroom for their extradition hearings. The Hyatts appeared in court the next day, Jennifer first, George second. Well aware that Jennifer had confessed, her attorney knew that she faced an almost certain conviction upon returning to Tennessee for trial. His advice, delay the inevitable. My lawyer advised me to refuse extradition. So that's what I did. We are requesting that a warrant be issued by the governor of the state of Tennessee. Buying time for his client, Jennifer's attorney told the court that Tennessee's governor would have to file a formal extradition request before she would return to the state. 
Jennifer looked on in silence. She just didn't know what to do. Didn't know what she was doing and had never been in this kind of situation before. George, on the other hand, had been in and out of courtrooms his entire adult life. He seemed to have disdain for everyone, um, the police, uh, the witnesses. And he wasn't afraid of facing a Tennessee jury. I want to sign you, Honor. I want to sign my extradition. But when his attorney informed him that Jennifer was going to fight, George did an abrupt about face. I'm not going to leave her without a book. Like Bonnie and Clyde before them, George and Jennifer seemed determined to go down together. The same day Jennifer and George were in an Ohio courtroom, the people of Tennessee said goodbye to Officer Cotton Morgan. That was a, one of the largest funerals in Morgan County. We had to, we had to have the funeral in an in elementary school gymnasium. And I think it was over 2,000 people there. That just sent chills up my back, you know, just seeing that support. Three weeks after Wayne Morgan was laid to rest, the town of Kingston showed a different sort of support. Tennessee's governor had signed the extradition warrant, and on August 22nd, U.S. Marshals took Jennifer and George Hyatt back to the very spot the corrections officer had been gunned down. They brought them separately. Um, they wouldn't tell us what time they were supposed to be there. The Hyatts also arrived in unmarked cars, but the precautions didn't deter the angry crowd waiting for them at the courthouse. There were people who lined the street and shouted at them. And unlike the morning George escaped, there were far more than two guards on hand to escort the Hyatts across the parking lot. Security was phenomenally tight. More uh, um, police cruisers than uh, uh, the town of Kingston's probably ever seen. Inside the courthouse, armed guards brought the Hyatts before the judge. Both were shackled uh, rather heavily. But while the press had once compared the couple to Bonnie and Clyde, onlookers couldn't help but ask, was the quiet woman shackled next to George the same outlaw who broke her lover out of jail, killing a lawman in the process? Jennifer, she seemed medicated when she came to court, honestly. She didn't utter a word as the judge announced the charges against her and the possible outcome. They had filed an attempt to seek the death penalty. After charges were filed, the Hyatts were remanded into custody. Bail was not an option. Immediately after the hearing, they uh, were sent to separate prisons. With the fugitives finally locked away behind maximum security bars, the state of Tennessee began building a first-degree murder case against Jennifer Hyatt. There was rock-solid evidence in this case against her. The state had eyewitnesses, surveillance video, even a signed confession. But would it be enough to convince a jury to sentence a mother of three to death? Coming up, a jailhouse journal reveals the mind of a killer. Whatever is in a prison cell it does not have a reasonable expectation of privacy. And the defense makes a desperate gamble to avoid a death sentence. It was an unfair type of thing to put before us as a family. In the fall of 2005, Jennifer Hyatt was back in a Tennessee penitentiary. But the former prison nurse was working. She was awaiting trial. Jennifer had been charged with gunning down Tennessee Corrections Officer Wayne Cotton Morgan during a jailbreak to free her incarcerated husband, George Hyatt. Now facing a possible death sentence, there appeared to be little hope for Jennifer, short of a second jailbreak. There was no question that Jennifer Hyatt was the person who fired the gun that killed Cotton Morgan. We had an eyewitness, we had the murder weapon, everything was strong about this case. In fact, with a conviction almost a foregone conclusion, the ultimate decision in Jennifer and George's all but open and shut case wasn't in the hands of the jury. Instead, the fate of this modern day Bonnie and Clyde ultimately rested with the family of the man they'd murdered. The state had already filed a death penalty case against the Hyatts, but when it came to actually pursuing it, the prosecutors passed the buck. The Attorney General 
they made it very plain that, that they sort of left it up to the family. And that fall, the family had no doubts. Jennifer and George deserved death. I don't know if it was just anger or whether it was just me wanting to see her die or pay for what she had done. There was only one complication. Any jury is very hesitant about taking the life of a woman, but even more importantly, taking the life of a mother of three young children. They can't separate the consequences that that decision will have on those children's lives for years to come. In the end, everything would hinge on whether the jury saw Jennifer as a willing accomplice or a desperate woman at the end of her rope. Unfortunately for the defense, prosecutors had some damaging evidence that strongly suggested the former, and it came direct from Jennifer. Back in August, when Jennifer was extradited to Tennessee, she'd left a few things behind in her cell. The jailers, as a routine procedure, searched her jail cell. At that point, they found a number of letters to different people, including George Hyatt, and also a journal that she had begun while she was in custody. All I was allowed to have in there was paper and pencil. So that's what I did, I wrote. And I just basically wrote a life history. The defense feared the writings would dispel any doubt that Jennifer was anything but a willing accomplice, starting with the words she'd scrawled across the top of her journal. She had actually entitled it the modern day Bonnie and Clyde. And the letters? Written to friends and family, Jennifer had signed each one with her new nickname, Bonnie. That was, as you can imagine, not helpful to us. Jennifer's attorneys fought to suppress the Bonnie and Clyde journal and her letters, claiming they'd been improperly seized. They'd come and got me and took me down to booking. And the U.S. Marshals were down there. And I'm like, oh, am I leaving? They're like, yeah. I said, what about all my stuff in my cell? We'll send it to you. And I never got it. Despite her attorney's protest, the judge ruled to allow Jennifer's letters and journal as evidence. The law is pretty clear that uh, whatever is in a prison cell, it does not have a reasonable expectation of privacy. Faced with overwhelming evidence and Jennifer's incriminating letters, the defense had only one hope for saving Jennifer's life. We had asked for a plea bargain in April of 06, and it was denied. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. According to Jennifer's attorney, prosecutors denied the request due to tremendous pressure from Officer Morgan's family. The family did not want to settle this case. They wanted to see the ultimate punishment. To escape that punishment, the defense did the only thing they could do. They had their client start another journal of sorts, a detailed statement that portrayed Jennifer not as Bonnie Parker, but as an abused woman. We wanted to convey that George Hyatt was the mastermind behind this entire incident and that, that Jennifer Hyatt was a puppet under his control. To back up their account, Jennifer's attorneys collected phone records to illustrate George's relentless surveillance and medical records chronicling Jennifer's suicide attempt. You could see him ratcheting up the pressure on her to go through with his plans. And after her suicide attempt, I believe she was just vulnerable enough to believe that it was the only thing that she could do to save her own life. I had basically given up trying to fight him. And to cap things off, the defense sent a camera crew to Utah. My lawyer had went out to Salt Lake and interviewed my mom and my kids and a couple of other family members. Probably 15, 20 minutes long, talking with Jennifer Hyde's children, just talking about what a death sentence would mean to them. Mm, pray that she don't get the death penalty. Mm. Then, well aware whose hands held Jennifer's fate, her attorney sent the entire package to Officer Morgan's family. It was an unfair type of thing to put before us. Someone that I love was taken from me. Someone they love was taken away from them, but they're in prison. They still have their life. We wanted to press, press further for the death penalty. 
Anxious to avoid a death sentence, the defense made one last emotional request for a plea bargain to the victim's family. The district attorney's office gave us some DVDs of an interview with Jennifer's mother, and we saw her children. But would the unorthodox defense tactic pay off? I think that had a lot to do with, you know, kind of softening my heart a little bit. The Morgan family relented. With their consent, prosecutors started plea negotiations. In exchange for a life sentence, Jennifer Hyatt pled guilty to first-degree murder on September 17, 2007. I would take it all back if I could, and I would still accept this punishment. I just want you to know I'm sorry. <laughs> As a condition of her plea, Jennifer had to sit down face to face with Officer Morgan's widow. She made sure I knew him very well, knew that they had been married for 36 years, knew what she was doing that day. She made sure I knew him, knew who I took. According to the terms of her plea, Jennifer agreed to testify against George Hyatt. There's no way I can make up for what I did, but if that's what the family wants, I will do it. Testifying against George might bring comfort to the Morgan family, but it won't bring closure to Jennifer. No matter how many locks separate them, she says she still fears her former lover. After all, he's already stalked her once from inside a prison cell. I'm scared to death, because I don't know, does he have hands here too? <laughs> 